You're listening to the Jolly Swagman Podcast. Here's your host, Joe Walker. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, swagmen and swagettes. Welcome back to the show. Now, if you're like me, you probably had a very vague concept of British rule in India. My images of the British Raj are scantily gleaned from a pastiche of sources. I can conjure black and white photographs of Gandhi. I tend to blend in scenes from Orwell's essays, A Hanging and Shooting an Elephant, which I've since remembered were actually set not in India, but in Burma. And I recall literary depictions from biographies of Winston Churchill, of a young Churchill, as a soldier in Bangalore and Calcutta, and of how he allowed the 1943 Bengal famine to break out as Prime Minister. It's an altogether very patchy picture of British rule in India. The British Raj lasted nearly a century, from 1858 to 1947, a period punctuated by some unfortunate bouts of violence and suppression during which the Brits delivered tea, trains, cricket and democracy to a benighted subcontinent, leaving it, we are assured, net better off. But this story masks an altogether more sinister truth. For India was not, in the beginning, conquered and subjugated by the British government, but by a single commercial company operating from a nondescript building just five windows wide in London. That is, the British East India Company. The East India Company's birth could not have been less less auspicious, set in the rickety Founders Hall in 1599, around the time Shakespeare was reviewing his first draft of Hamlet. A motley collection of merchants and former pirates were assembled to form what was an incredible innovation in its time, a joint stock corporation. The purpose of this corporation would be trade with the East Indies, hence its name, and eventually the company was launched with its royal charter giving it express permission to wage war. By the time the company pivoted its focus to India, India was one of the most powerful countries in the world. On the 28th of August, 1608, Captain William Hawkins became the first company man to set foot on Indian soil. At that time, India contributed a quarter of global manufacturing and had a population of 150 million people, or about a fifth of the world's total. The Mughal Emperor was the richest monarch in the world, with about 100 million pounds annually, or 10 billion in today's terms, flowing into the imperial coffers in Delhi. In contrast, Britain was a tiny economic backwater. Fast forward 150 years, and the company's domination of India seems slow at first, but then to happen almost all at once. In 1757, the East India Company seized control of Bengal, and in the years that followed, it continued to annex large chunks of India. At its height, the East India Company had a standing army of 260,000, twice the size of Britain's. So how did a single commercial company come to enslave a nation of 200 million people? This episode answers that question, and my guest is the acclaimed historian and travel writer, William Dalrymple, whose new book, The Anarchy, sets out to explain this untold story. We discuss how the East India Company took control of India, but we also delve into historiography, into William's back background, his making as a travel writer and historian, and many other things besides. William is, is like an ideal podcast guest. He's erudite, charming, entertaining, well-traveled, and I so wanted to speak with him for longer. We, we originally booked in for two hours, but another appointment came up. He had to fill in for someone at the Jaipur Literary Festival in Adelaide. Uh, but this hour we ended up recording is just jam-packed with laughter, with erudition, and with information you may not have heard before. So without much further ado, I hope you enjoy. William Dalrymple, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So it is Sunday the 3rd of November and we are in Adelaide in South Australia. 
in a very curious recording studio yeah. at the back of a trailer park. <laughs> in some sort of industrial <laughs> suburb. <laughs> Steel construction around left and right. It looks like there's a place that John Travolta's about to turn up with his friend and, uh, and order a Mac, a Mac Royale. <laughs> <laughs> and I've come all the way from Sydney to follow you here through a, uh, an arduous plane trip with a, a four-year-old girl squealing like a dolphin in front of me. But uh, nonetheless, I will do my best to ask some erudite and uh, stimulating questions. Take us back to 18th century India. <laughs> <laughs> despite, uh, despite what you have done to me. <laughs> I'm innocent. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. William Dalrymple, born in 1965, acclaimed historian, writer, co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literary Festival. Uh, in the course of researching for this conversation, I discovered that you went to school at Ampleforth College. Uh, I've been to Ampleforth. It was in, Not uh, many people have. <laughs> <laughs> it was 2010, so I was doing a gap year between high school and university. I was living at Clongerswood College, a uh, castle outside of Dublin, where James Joyce went to school for a while. And uh, we had a, a rugby game of Australian gap students versus Ampleforth teachers and locals. Who won? <laughs> well, <laughs> first let me tell you, what I, what I remember about Ampleforth, I remember the, the side of the, the sandstone castle just lighting up like gold when the sun lit it. I remember uh, it was in Yorkshire because we had to go through York on arrival. And I was very taken by the, the nightlife in York. And I remember this game. From which, which incidentally, we, of course, were, were banned strictly from ever <laughs> participating. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm sure. That, that, that would be a, yeah. a disaster if you weren't. But uh, I remember, so this, this game we played, uh, it was about this time in 2010. And the snow was literally knee deep in some parts of the field. I've actually got a photo I'll show you. And... Uh, we had to. I have no, I have no sympathy. Is, <laughs> I had to do I'm this. I'm in the, the back row at the middle. <laughs> we, is, we had to call the game this off. Sounds like an option. Right? <laughs> Why to... would anyone play, play rugby full stop? Yeah. Why would anyone play rugby in the snow in Yorkshire well, in winter? It, it was hilarious. We they called the game off halfway through because people's hands were freezing. We couldn't catch the ball. <laughs> so after that, we we settled in at the White Swan, and some a, 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 a hostelry I know well, <laughs> <laughs> and some locals had just come in from a hunt uh, and it was, it was a very aristocratic sort of atmosphere. But how, how do you look back on your, your 10 years at Ampleforth? Well, it's, it's a very mixed bunch of stuff. On one hand, I had an incredibly good education there and what, taught, what I was taught there uh, and my history teachers and my English teachers there set me up 100% for what I'm doing now. Um, it was an English teacher there who gave me my first travel book and, in a sense, started my uh, uh, trajectory off towards becoming a travel writer, which is what I did immediately after college. What was the book? Uh, she gave me Patrick Lee Fermor's A Time of Gifts, uh, which remains one of my kind of sacred books. One, you know, one In any desert island selection, however small, it would be there. And... Um, I had an amazing history teacher too, who taught me medieval history, the Crusades. First interested me in 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 the world, the other side of the Mediterranean, uh, and had a very sophisticated library which he would lend. Um, uh, oh, and I remember reading early Arab history and so on there uh, at the age of uh, seventeen and eighteen, which I think would happen in very few other places. On the other hand, it was a kind of completely bonkers institution. It was uh, a, a boarding school run in the late 20th century by monks, Benedictine monks, mm. uh, operating on the rule of St. Benedict, which was written in the 6th century uh, as a sort of means for coping with life after the fall of Rome. <laughs> uh, and not necessarily immediately applicable <laughs> to, <laughs> to, life, to life at this end of the millennium. And um, there were kind of, I mean... It, Another plus was it was, as you saw, incredibly beautiful. It was mm. one of the most astonishing places. And I got my taste for sort of travelling around and, and uh, beetling around as a historian, going around on a bicycle, looking at churches and, uh, and writing about... I mean, my first published piece, age 13, was on, a, uh, on a, uh, an Anglo-Viking strange hybrid... Uh, high cross in, in a little village called Stonegrove that was about seven miles from Ampleforth. Mm. 
on the other hand, it's kind of you know, there's all sorts of incredibly unhealthy things about it. It was, uh, it was, although I was only sort of vaguely aware of it at the time, it was a, a, a major centre of sort of Catholic child abuse, like it seems every other Catholic institution in the world. Uh, rather unflatteringly, I never even got my bottom pinched. <laughs> and every every few years, a little sort of questionnaire comes through from the North Yorkshire Police saying, you know, did you know Father X? Did did he do anything to you? And each time I have to write back and say, actually no, <laughs> even though I was in his care for you know a year uh, and, and was, would have been a sort of ripe target. Uh, and uh, I was a, a quite a small, fat little boy with a uh, pudding bowl haircut, which I think clearly warded me, warded demons off as successfully as garlic or a, uh, or a, a sort of, uh, uh, how do you keep vampires away? Garlic and, and silver bullets. So, right. yeah. And crucifixes. And crucifixes. Um, well, crucifixes probably have attracted <laughs> these particular type of vampire. But. Uh. And um, also, I mean, I, I certainly didn't send my kids to a, to a boys-only school locked away miles from civilization. Um, and I don't think it is probably the best way of uh, bringing up kids, nor do I think necessarily bringing them up only immersed in one religious tradition, mm. uh, which was something my parents believed very strongly in. Um, mm. I don't think that's probably the best way to prepare anyone for the modern world. But I was I was actually happy there, and uh, it very much prepared me for what I do now in an odd sort of way. Mm. I mean, in a very unlikely way. I mean, had I been interested in astrophysics or something, I don't think it would have been a very suitable education. <laughs> but <laughs> as I was interested in medieval history and uh, archaeology and art history, it really couldn't have done me better. Mm. On the 24th of January 1984, just about two months shy of your 19th birthday, you found yourself in Delhi, which is a world apart from Ampleforth, not just geographically. 26th of January. <laughs> I said 26th of January, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how on earth did that happen? Huge um, series of chances. The, the system in those days was that if you were a bright scholarship boy, um, you would take uh, your Oxbridge exams to get into Oxford or Cambridge in November, mm. which left you uh, until the following September before you had next had anything to do. You, you, were, you were free to do what you liked. You, this was the famous gap year. Um, and um, those nine months, you could do what you liked. And I had been planning this for some time, um, as I, as I you know, always hoped that I would make it to doing the Oxbridge exam and, and going to Oxford or Cambridge and studying history or archaeology. Um, and my big plan as a keen, enthusiastic sort of teenage archaeologist who spent his summers digging on causewayed camps and brochs in the in Orkney and uh, um, strange uh, Viking burial sites in, in, in the English Midlands. My big plan was to go and dig in Iraq um, on Assyrian sites. And, you know, mm. I was very into that whole Indiana Jones idea of sort of sitting in the desert with uh, sort of, you know, Syrian bulls merging out of sand dunes. But just before I was due to go, having got a place on this dig, um, Saddam Hussein closed down the British School of Archaeology in Baghdad, saying it was a nest of British spies, which, for all I knew, because I never made it there, it probably was. Uh, and um, very much uh, as a second best option at the last minute, ended up going with my best friend who had got a job teaching in India. Hmm. And India was somewhere which I not only did not have an interest in, uh, I had a sort of mild aversion in. My elder brother was my school t uh, school uh, hero. He'd been a sort of double blue, at, uh, represented Oxford in cricket and, and, and rugby. And then he went to India and came back as this sort of bedraggled hippie, filling the house with sort of terrible Tamil tack and sort of horrible, as I thought, age 14, horrible uh, 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 sort of papier-mâché dolls and started making coffee in a weird way, pouring it from one container to another and uh, had long bedraggled hair and terrible facial uh, hair, looked like sort of Neil Young at his worst moment as a heroin <laughs> addict, sort of circa Tonight's the Night, that sort of era. And um, I kind of quite never quite forgave India for this transformation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, anyway, with, with, with no other plans and every other thing that I wanted to do sort of apparently not possible, I did jump on a plane to India, completely unprepared, knew nothing about India, had no uh, idea that uh, I had any connection with this place or would have any connection with it. And immediately fell in love. It was very odd. I mean, you know, really profoundly, properly, within about three weeks, I was thinking, you know, I may well never leave here. Uh, and indeed, I haven't. I'm, I'm still there now. And I was 18 then. I'm now 54. 
uh, and most of my time uh, in between those two ages has been spent in India writing in one way or another about it. And um, since then, I found that not only did generations of my family from south of Scotland go out there, make livings there with first the East India Company, then the Raj, but even more bizarrely, it turns out I had quite a significant trickle uh, of Indian blood. In fact, two trickles. One uh, Islamic Mughal via um, Nur Jahan, the great empress of the Mughals, great great niece who married a man called James Dorimple in Hyderabad in 1789. So actually, you know, mainline genetic connection to the Mughal dynasty, which I've been writing about for the previous 20 years. I had no idea before these documents turned up in Edinburgh when I was writing White Moguls. And then a, a second connection, which was to a Hindu Bengali woman a little bit later in the early, uh, late 18th century. And... Um, I always wonder, you know, is the fact, does the fact that generations of my family, although I was brought up in Scotland, had no knowledge that anyone in my family, except possibly I knew that my dad had been there at partition, but, I mean, other than that, I think I had no knowledge that anyone in my family had ever been to India mm. um, uh, ancestrally. Uh, and I'd always, I always wonder, is, you know, is, is the fact of either the, just the experience of generations of my forebears or the actual genetic connection of blood uh, from that part of the world, whether that is, you know, the reason that I responded to India rather than, you know, a, 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 a thousand other countries I visited in the course of my life and, you know, and happily left never to go back to. Uh, and it's a very odd thing. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Does, does the experience of your forebears wandering a particular patch of earth somehow communicate itself? Does, or, ditto, you know, the, the DNA that you inherit, is it just a, a bunch of chemicals and, uh, and genomes, or is it, uh, does it actually leave an impression of place and an interest in a place mm. and, and mean that when your descendants arrive there, they suddenly feel a connection to it? It's a, I mean, it's a serious question. Mm. Your Indian blood is about 116th? I think even more remote than that. Right. Okay. <laughs> 32nd or something. 32nd, right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. It yeah. Is, it's, not, it's not close by, but yeah. it is there. Yeah. Uh, now, and, you know, as far as I know, I don't have Bulgarian blood or, <laughs> <laughs> or Venezuelan blood or something, you know, that, that, w- that might have drawn me off in a different direction. Yeah. Hmm. So, from when you first met Delhi, a city the size of about 1 million people in 1984, it's now more than 26 million people. Does that change the character of a city? Well, at this particular moment we're talking, Delhi is under a uh, terrible chemical smog. It is not only the most polluted place on Earth currently, it is, I think, something like 20 times over the safety level mm. uh, following Diwali. This is, a, I mean, a freak that happens this time of year. Nonetheless, uh, it is true that Delhi is not becoming any easier to live in, shall we say, um, not least because of this pollution which no one seems to be bothering about. And my wife is an asthmatic, and she is seriously concerned about you know what what the, you know whether we have a future there. Mm. Um, there is also an extremely nasty uh, far right wing government in 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 place at the moment. So, uh, for the first time in many years, we are beginning to ask ourselves whether this is a sustainable future. But certainly, I've, you know, I can't imagine actually leaving the country. Mm. Um, maybe it'll be some village in the Himalayas or something next. But uh, Delhi's looking Delhi's looking quite tricky at the moment. Mm. I want to briefly ask you to outline the journey you took when you were 22 years old, because this was sort of the making of of William Dalrymple, the writer. Can you tell us what that was about and how that came to be? Sure. So since I was about 12 or 13, what I used to do at Ampleforth, first of all, uh, was to get on a bicycle and go and look at things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I got my driving license, uh, I used to go around in a clapped out old banger. Um, And... Even before I was in India, I was, you know, I was beetling around writing about stuff, photographing it. I was a very keen photographer uh, as a teenager and digging um, in, in my summer holidays. And so when I went to India, the first thing I did in 84 was to just go all around the country um, with a very, very, very low budget, but sleeping rough in tombs and, and temples and uh, and had this sort of extraordinary year that, from which, in a sense, I've never recovered. <laughs> uh, this sort of life-changing year, discovering this entire incredibly complex country with <clears throat> this rich succession of layers, Hindu, Muslim, Portuguese, Dutch, French, British. Um, and 
then I did a journey again, sort of echoing the stuff I suppose I'd done at Ampleforth in uh, uh, studying the Crusades. I went off following the route of the First Crusade from Scotland to Jerusalem, uh, hitchhiking and walking uh, right across uh, uh, Italy, across to Yugoslavia, down to uh, Bulgaria, Greece, across Turkey, down through Syria, uh, Jordan, uh, and into Israel, Palestine. And it was only then in 1986 that I did the journey that, as you say, in a sense, made me as a writer, which was the journey that became my first book in Xanadu. Um, and it very much in my head then was, you know, was part of a long succession of journeys I'd already made. Um, not a beginning, but a, but a sort of, uh, but a more serious uh, and more ambitious version of what I'd been doing for a while. And uh, this was to follow Marco Polo's journey to Jerusalem. And in all honesty, that the the stimulus for this had come not from any burning lifelong interest in Marco Polo, but instead the fact that my college at Cambridge, which I was very lucky to be in, Trinity, was an incredibly rich college, and and in a very benign way, used to work hard at finding ways to share its its incredible investment wealth and 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 uh, its bequests from old dons and, and old members of college and so on to find ways to get that in an improving manner to the students and, and, and encourage them. Um, and I remember just passing a notice board one day and seeing uh, a travel prize specifically aimed at medieval history students. Now, I knew there were only about 10 others in the whole college <laughs> who would be eligible for this. And, uh, uh, and most of those probably couldn't be asked to apply anyway. So I went into the library that day and put in an application, looked at the Times atlas of history and try to work out what the longest medieval journey cost I could do possibly was um, therefore for which I could apply for the most possible funds and um, it was Marco Polo's journey and just for the hell of it I thought I'll ask for a thousand pounds and the day after I finished my exams an envelope was put under my door of my college with a cheque for 750 pounds um, and I suddenly realised to my horror, I was actually sort of now committed to, <laughs> <laughs> to making this sort of ridiculously ambitious journey, starting in Jerusalem, where I'd finished the previous year doing this crusade, um, working up through uh, Syria to Turkey, Iran, up the length of Pakistan, over the Karakoram Highway, which had opened up for the first time that year, into the back end of Xinjiang, uh, uh, across the Gobi Desert, uh, and then over the length and breadth of China up to Kublai Khan's old pleasure dome of of uh, Xanadu in, in the Mongolia. you were the first Westerners to visit his ruined palace in over a century? I don't know, because there wasn't a sort of visitor's book there. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know where I read But certainly that. there are no other records okay. of anyone since, I think, the 1930s having made it there. I'm sure probably someone went right. at some okay. point, some diplomat from somewhere um, uh, got permission. But uh, it's not impossible at right. all that we were the first there. Uh, certainly we were the first to write about it. Mm. Um and no one since I published the book has, has claimed, you know, I, I was there five years earlier. Or <laughs> and um, Xanadu, immortalised by Coleridge, is not a figment of his opium-fed imagination, <laughs> is a real place. Uh, its real name at the, uh, was actually Shangtu, um, and it was the palace of the Yuan Emperor uh, Kublai Khan, who again was a real person, the grandson of Genghis. Mm. And Kublai Khan ruled partly from uh, what's now Beijing, the, under the Forbidden City, um, uh, but also for quite a lot of the time from uh, his beloved steppes. Uh, and uh, Shangtu was, in a sense, on the edge, just the nearest point to China that was, that was definitely Mongolia. <laughs> um, and when we went there, there wasn't a whole lot left. It was an archaeological site rather than a... Um, you know, there were very few standing ruins, but it was an incredibly atmospheric site, like some enormous uh, Iron Age hill fort or something with these enormous vallums and ditches and platforms where palaces had once been and fragments of roof tiles, which we put in our pockets and, and took home. And I've still got on my desk in Delhi to this day as a sort of good good luck talisman. Um, and the point of the journey had been to follow Marco Polo and at the beginning, in the, it's the opening scene in the book, um, 
like Marco Polo, we, I, we went to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which is the uh, uh, the site allegedly of, of Christ's uh, death and resurrection. It's both the Hill of Calvary and the tomb. Um, uh, and uh, we took, as he did, oil from the lamps in the Holy Sepulchre, which in the Middle Ages was considered like a, you know a, a talisman of incredibly powerful. Uh, blessed uh, good luck, you know, a million times more powerful than uh, than holy water or something. This was this this lamp which had burnt at the site where, if you were a, a true believing Christian in the Middle Ages, you would have believed that uh, Christ uh, rose from the dead and was resurrected and, and ushered in a new era in human history. Th- those lamps still burn there. And I got a little um, little file of uh, uh, from the body shop, which had just opened at that sort of time, <laughs> filled it with this oil. And at the end of the journey, we did indeed pour it on the throne dais of Kublai Khan wow. in Zanadu. Mission accomplished, which was <laughs> which was a very exciting moment. And then in a sort of, um, uh, it seemed the most obvious thing to do, we recited um, uh, in, in Zanadu to Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the Sacred River ran and so on and so on. Um, and... Um, I always knew that I was this. I mean, I, I had set out with a view to writing a book about this, right. and had been keeping notes the whole way with a view to writing a book. And um, when we got back to Beijing, the people we were staying with, who were diplomats and that we happened to know, um, put us in touch with the Times correspondent, who wrote a short report, and then thought, "No, this this has to be a feature." So we got it uh, on to uh, amazingly exciting at the age of whatever we were, 21, um, on the front cover of the Times Weekend Supplement. And immediately I had 10 invitations to write a book from publishers. And the guy I accepted the uh, that offer from, who's a guy called Michael Fishwick, who then worked at uh, William Collins & Son, is still my editor uh, yeah. 30 years later. Yeah. Uh, and we, and he's, we've now just published, I suppose, our, our, I think our, our 12th book together. <laughs> Could you safely recreate that journey today? No, um, you couldn't because several bits of it will be tricky. Uh, most obviously, Syria, mm. um, and um, yeah, Syria would be very difficult to go mm. through at the moment. You could go through well until recently. You could have gone through Afghanistan, which we didn't weren't able to go through. Mm. Um, and, but no, Afghanistan is now pretty well. Uh, you, yeah, you wouldn't want to go in on from uh, you could get into herat probably from iran but the next stage from herat to kabul would be uh, pretty suicidal at the moment and uh while you could definitely go through western china if you were a uh, a foreigner um you would be going through a very different place to the very happy and uh uh, and beautiful and extraordinary uh, state of Xinjiang, which we went through in the late 80s. Now, of course, the site mm. of these massive Chinese detention camps. Mm. But uh, a lot of it would still be unchanged. I took my kids, who are now the age I was when I made that journey, um, down the Karakoram Highway, which is my favourite leg of it and in northern Pakistan. I mean, without question, the most beautiful road in the world, uh, of the bits of the world I've seen. Mm. And it's more or less unchanged, that, those sort of bits. It's lovely. I mean, it's slightly larger um, village in some places and the places have grown and other places have got smaller. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's still a stunning, stunning trip. Yeah. I saw photos of you as a, a 21-year-old, which is how old you were when you, when you took the trip. You were a good, good-looking young man. Oh, I'm curious, what's are, uh... are you Im- Are you implying there's been some sort of decline <laughs> since then? <laughs> no, no comment at all. No. <laughs> no, my question is, what, what's romance on the road like in some of the more con- socially conservative countries? Can you, can you sort of go into a bar and pick someone up like you can in the West? Well, the r- romance on the road was complicated in that journey because I was travelling with two girls, one of whom was this sort of fearsome uh, woman who, who, who was lovely, but uh, it was a sort of terrifyingly organised and uh, uh, efficient young woman who went on to become sort of, you know, businesswoman of the year, run Marks Lucy? and Spencer. This was Laura. Laura, OK. Uh, who was the daughter of a British High Commissioner, had already, you know, travelled the world by the time she was right. with me, aged 21. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm hugely grateful to her because she, uh, she got me organised on this trip in a way that I never would have managed. Mm. Um 
Uh, so anyway, that romance were not on the, was not on the cards on, on for, the, for, for for that edge of thing. And then for the second half of the trip, um, I went with my recently split up ex girlfriend, who who I would dearly have loved to have uh, uh, had romance on the road with, but uh, who had recently gone off with somebody else. And uh, so the slightly sort of uh, the slightly sort of sexually fraught, uh, but uh, uh, unromantic <laughs> <laughs> trip, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I've I've had I've had uh, uh, romance on the road uh, before and since, but not on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, as a general rule, um, no, of course you. Can, I mean, it's uh, you know, as any backpacker knows, you, you uh, governments uh, are uh, are very keen that you don't break any rules in public. But what goes on in uh, uh, what goes on in between consenting individuals in, in hotel rooms is not a uh, is not, I don't think, an issue. And mm-hmm. even if you're in revolutionary Iran as a traveller, mm-hmm. let's talk about the anarchy. So. John Key, an historian who you reference in your book, wrote a book on the East India Company, the British East India Company called uh, The Honourable Company. And in the beginning, he has this entertaining passage where he imagines history professors, elderly history professors dying at their desks at the library writing about the company because they're so, I think it triplicated all of its, all of its records. And indeed, you, uh, you nearly suffered this same fate yourself. I remember reading a, a Guardian article from 2015, which was opening the curtain on the book uh, to be published the following year in 2016, although obviously now it's, it's 2019. Um, I also read your, your father, who, who passed away during its writing, was convinced that you'd never finish it. Uh, why, why did this this book take so long to produce? It took longer than any other book I've ever written. And um, you're right, I thought, it, I, mean, I thought I was going to knock it off in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, that Six years happened. later. Yeah. Six years later. Yeah. Um, the... The story is, is incredibly complex, incredibly uh, complicated piece of history, What the, the, the breakup of India in the 18th century. It's very easy when you're writing history, sort of something like the Mughal Empire or the Roman Empire, where you have a capital and, and mm. various emperors that uh, you, know, you can just follow. When a great empire disintegrates, there's a million plot lines going off in a, in a hundred directions. And trying to tame that sort of mess is much more complicated than writing a linear story through one great uh, dynasty. But more to the point, as you hinted, the um, the East India Company did everything in triplicate, and everything down to its very first meeting on the twenty fourth of September, fifteen ninety nine, is there in the British Library. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it is alleged thirty five miles of records. Wow. So no one, in, you know, even if you were to start at the age of eighteen and work through to your you know ninety fifth birthday, uh, no one is ever going to get to read all that stuff. Um, really, and um, you have to sample. Yeah. Plus, of course, that's only half the story, because if you're being um, a modern historian and trying to get the voice, the lost voices of of the other side, that you know, the conquered, the enemy, the 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 other, in this case, the Mughals, um, you have to read all the Mughal sources too, and they're much more difficult. Although they're, or well, for a start, they're more diffusely scattered and in sort of strange places. So the single most interesting thing we found on the Mughals relevant to this book was a, a Shah Alam Nama, the history of the emperor Shah Alam, uh, which was in a tiny provincial library in a place called Tonk, which is halfway between Jaipur and Bundi, which is, I mean, really is about as near to the middle of nowhere as, as you're ever going to get in this desert state of Rajasthan. Um, and it was in Persian, which is a language I only have a, 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 a fairly amateur grasp on, and, and I have to work with a colleague called Bruce Winnell, who I've been working with for the last 20 years. Um, sadly, we've just discovered it's going to be our last project together, as he's now got uh, terminal uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, and has 10 months, I discovered this two days ago, has 10 months to live. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, definitely closing uh, quite a lot of doors for future projects, uh, as well as being incredibly sad. This was an extraordinary scholar who mm. can read 18th century Indian Persian in a way that no one else alive can mm. do. Um, and uh, is also just a, a beautiful, beautiful translator who who who, mm. um, who can... Uh, witty, clever, erudite translations, which I think are the main argument, uh, are the main ornament of not just mm. this book, but um, White Moguls and uh, and Return of the King. 
an, an incredible partnership as well. Um, yeah, we've been working together 20 years. Mm. Um, and uh, I literally got an email in Sydney three days ago saying, mm. Willie, it's been a great pleasure working together 20 years. I'm afraid that's going to be our last project. I have 10 months to live, which isn't, I'm glad to say, an email I've ever received from anyone before. Mm. Um, it's literally like a death sentence, poor mm. guy. He's got a very advanced cancer. Mm. The British East India Company was a, a particularly special form of Tudor innovation that is a joint stock corporation. I think it was the, the fourth of its kind, the first being the, the Muscovy Company. How was right. it how was it born? In what circumstances uh, was the company created? The man behind it uh, is a figure called Customer Smythe, Thomas Sir Thomas Smythe. And Customer Smythe, as his name uh, suggests, was in charge of the customs. Uh, and uh, he was the he was the kind of uh, the senior trading figure in, in Elizabethan London. Lots of ties to people we today would call pirates, um, privateers uh, preying on Spanish and Portuguese shipping that was then regarded as entirely legitimate by everyone in Britain. Um, they're not obviously everyone in Portugal and Spain. <laughs> and the, the Spanish, it's a matter, matter of perspective. Yeah, yeah. The, Sp <laughs> the Spanish ambassador would occasionally go to court and shout, pirates, pirates, the people. <laughs> um, anyway, Smythe was a worried man in 1599 because his rivals in Holland had uh, two or three different companies had just formed uh, to uh, pioneer a passage over the Cape of Good Hope Mm -hmm. and uh, ran, uh, ran there and off to Indonesia and to import spices, which was something that Smythe had made a fortune in, but importing from Aleppo and from Cairo, second or third hand from, from the original producers. And the Dutch just went straight to, to uh, Indonesia, bought the stuff there, sailed back and sold it for a fraction of the price, much, much fresher, much, uh, much less shop-worn than the stuff Smythe was producing on the market. And so on the 24th of September, 1599, he calls a public meeting. And uh, not only do the big ship owners and, and privateers and pirates turn up, but also quite a lot of kind of you know, small mum and dad businesses in Tudor London, uh, guys who describe themselves as vintners or skinners or haberdashers. And these guys um, put in their £5 and £10 and £6. And the company is born. It sells off to... Uh, uh, India, it gets uh, three quarters of the way there when they bump into a Portuguese galleon coming <laughs> coming back, and so they know what to do. So, they, <laughs> so, so the Jack Sparrows uh, in the yeah. crew just sort of you know jump, uh, swing over on their guy ropes and do all the things that pirates do, and they just unloaded the entire contents of this unfortunate Portuguese galleon uh, into their hold and. Um, uh, uh, and sail, <laughs> and sail merrily back to London, Job where they done. sell the contents for one million pounds. And this piratical start yeah. uh, is the beginning of the East India Company. Mm -hmm. As with quite a lot of its subsequent trade, it was done. It was trade, but trade at the end of a bayonet or a, a sword. And its initial charter from the Crown in 1599 specifically authorized it to quotes wage war. Mm. Um, and this charter, which must have been a sort of fairly sort of uh, uh, casual document when it was produced because, A, they, no one knew whether the company was really going to get it together and, and, and sail anywhere. Uh, the previous attempt by the, the captain who they'd employed, Sir James Lanchester, ended up with him sinking his entire fleet and most of his crew being eaten by cannibals. <laughs> it's, so it's worth noting that uh, <laughs> the, the length of time it would take to travel from Britain to India in those days is no equivalent months. to, yeah. you know, today, how long it would take Elon Musk to get to Mars. Sure, yeah, six, exactly. Six to nine months, depending. Ex yeah. Exactly that. And um, anyway, so this charter, uh, which was issued was subsequently used by generations of East India Company uh, men to claim the rights not only to trade with the East, but also to mint coins, fortify fortresses, fight wars, um, uh, have law courts, uh, and, and, you know, act in the manner of a state. Mm. Uh, and that is what the East India Company did in India for the first uh, 150 years, they behaved moderately well <laughs> by East India Company standards um, and didn't go around ma doing many massacres. The hashtag, mm. not many massacres. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But in the 1740s, they began importing uh, military techniques from uh, early 18th century Europe, where there'd just been two enormous wars, the War of the Spanish Succession, the War of Austrian Succession, which had revolutionised warfare. And particularly Frederick the Great had come up with a whole load of new innovations, particularly in artillery, but also in muskets, bayonets and all sorts of stuff. Uh, none of which was really particularly rocket science. It was all quite simple stuff, but it, it changed the face of warfare. And the French were the first to realize you could train up local Indians just as well as you could train up Irishmen or Scotsmen uh, uh, in these techniques. And this happened in the 1740s. And in the first such battle, the Battle of the Adyar River in around 1740, I think it was 700 uh, French trained sepoys saw off 30,000 Mughal cavalry of the Nawab of the Carnatic. Mm. And this opens up a period of about 30 years when both the English and the French companies realise that they can more or less do what they like, that there's no force in India that can stop these new military techniques. And both arm up massively. Um, in the Seven Year War, in the 1750s, the English company takes out the French company and they destroy the, the main headquarters at Chandanagar. And then also um, they begin encroaching on Bengal. And they first of all go to... Uh, Calcutta, which they retake, having been conquered by the local Nawab, who takes against them uh, building fortifications without permission. In fact, the fortifications are not aimed at him, they're aimed at the French. But he takes Calcutta. And so this um, newly arrived British uh, general called Robert Clive sails north, retakes Calcutta, defeats the French at Chandanagar, and at this point gets an incredibly important message. A local banker, not a local banker, the big, massive local banker, the Jagat Set, the banker of the world, who is to 18th century India what Rothschild will be in 19th century Europe. Um, it is said uh, in, in Bengali that... Uh, as just as the Ganges flows into the ocean, so gold flows into the coffers of the Jagat Set. Uh, and um, the Jagat Set, who is irritated with the new Nawab of Bengal, who is forcing him to give loans that he doesn't want and threatening to circumcise him uh, <laughs> if he resists, enough to concentrate most men's minds. Um, and uh, he simply offers Clive £2 million if he will topple the uh, the Jagat Set offers Clive £2 million if he will topple the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj What does Clive say? So Clive says, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and no problem, sir. And is there anyone else you'd like me to topple? <laughs> uh, and he goes up and he fights the Battle of Plassey, long depicted in... 1757. 1757, long depicted in British textbooks as this heroic action of brave, uh, brave Brits actually... It turns out just a, a complete setup as the main general on the other side is the guy who stands to become the new Nawab if he doesn't fight. Uh, and Clive then walks into the treasury at Moshidabad, which is the richest treasury in India, since Bengal has one million looms. And the reason the company is there in the first place is that this is now the world's centre of industrial production. There are an amazing amount of... Uh, weavers producing the greatest textiles in the world. And uh, the company has made its fortune over the previous century just trading in this stuff. Yeah. Now they've taken the capital and Clive wanders into the bank vaults and there is gold and silver and amazing mogul jewellery just sort of dripping on all sides. Later, when he's cross-questioned in Parliament about the way he just filled his pockets with this stuff, uh, he retorts, perhaps not even unfairly, my lords, I was astonished at my own moderation. <laughs> <laughs> he only took a few million. <laughs> you know, he could have taken everything. And um, this, again, is, is, is this, you know, as traditional history acknowledges, it, this is a major turning point. Mm. Suddenly the Brits are in charge of a bit of India. They are. Um, but it's not the Brits. It is this company. It is the East India Company, still very much a, a company run uh, for and by its shareholders yeah. and not the British government. Yeah. And, and this is why you wanted to retell this story. Yeah, I mean, in the 19th century, the Victorians muddied the waters by turning figures like Clive into the founders of the British Empire. Mm, Clive, and who features on our curry paste. Who features on your curry yeah. paste, <laughs> which is that uh, I have greatly enjoyed uh, uh, Instagramming <laughs> Clive of India curry paste since I got to Australia. 
to the horror and amazement of my Indian friends who can't believe that anyone would try and sell something. It's like having some Lord Voldemort sort of pickle or... <laughs> and Adolf Hitler Gherkins or something. I don't know. Sauerkraut. Uh, yeah. 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 And um, Clive um, soon hoovers up the rest of northern India. Uh, and he does this for the company, and the company uh, still a business operating out of one London office uh, in Leaden Hall Street, finds itself in effective control of the whole of the Mughal Empire by the end of the 18th century. And this is a kind of bonkers inversion of everything that you would expect um, and is one of the most improbable moments in all history because up to this point, when, well, when the company's founded... Britain is producing about 3% of world GDP mm -hmm. and India is producing, I think, 27.8%. So, in other words, about a third of world GDP is, is produced in India. Virtually nothing is produced in, in Britain, which is surviving on plundering Portuguese and Spanish <laughs> shipping. And um, the company more or less inverts this. By 1800, uh, Britain is producing about a, th a third of the world's GDP, and India is on its way to being produced to I think three percent, which is what it has wow. at, at the at independence. Just in a complete role reversal. Total role reversal, and and India moves from being one of the richest countries in the world with the most flourishing industrial base to being a third world country, which is what the Brits leave it in 1947. Mm. And Britain moves from being a, a, a third rate nation on the edge of Europe, uh, surviving on sort of haddock, cod and, uh, and, and a few lucky Portuguese galleons, uh, to being, you know, the, the British Empire that we think today. Mm. And the, the, there are two sources. One is India. The, the other is the, the Caribbean slave trade and the, and the plantation economy of the Caribbean. And together, these two sources of, of you know, fairly illicit and immoral wealth pour into Britain, le building all those gorgeous National Trust houses that, uh, you mm. know, one goes around as a tourist today having cream teas in and, and, and uh, you, you know, half expecting Colin mm. Firth to turn up sort of wading through, uh, through ponds and <laughs> doing the sort of thing Colin Firth does in his knickerbockers and, uh, and breeches. And... Uh, that is where the money of Britain came from. And that is the money that generated the whole imperial expansion of Britain as far as Australia, Canada, and, and most of the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, and something which, of course, only broke down after it began losing the sources of those wealth uh, in the 1940s with, uh, with decolonization. Wow. But it was a company that was doing it, a joint stock corporation. This is the crucial thing. Not the British government. So it becomes the British government, right. uh, but not until much later. Yeah. So the well, company... Maybe is, we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah, well, we'll just yeah, we'll do, the, do the, the, the date. So yeah. the company's founded 1599. Yeah. It starts getting a bit militaristic in the 1740s, making serious conquests in the 1750s. By 1799, its own private security force, the East India Company Army, is twice the size of the British Army. Mm -hmm. There are 100,000 troops in the British Army. There are 200,000 troops in the East India Company mm. Army. But by the 1830s, the British are beginning to realise that it's not really very healthy to have one company that has twice the size of your own uh, national army. And people are beginning to snip away at it, uh, regulate it and... and um, uh, uh, put a board of control over the top of it, a government body that's that's overlooking its its foreign affairs. And finally, in 1857, uh, the East India Company is, in our terms, nationalised, right. and it becomes uh, 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 part of the state. And yeah. and and so the Raj, which is the stuff that we see in Kipling, in those Merchant Ivory films, in Passage to India, that famous, much storied much filmed, much Sunday night dramaed moment, uh, is only 90 years. Mm. It's 1858 to 1947. Mm. Uh, but the East India Company is 1599 to 1858, to more than 250 mm. years. Mm. So in a sense, what we'll keep looking at is the sort of tip of the iceberg, the Raj, which yeah. pops out above the waves, while forgetting this enormous block of ice which sits beyond popular culture, yeah, invisible, I, which is the East India Company. And, you know, the, once you realise that, all this rhetoric that you get about the British Empire being, you know, about civilising uh, uh, Johnny Foreigner and bringing the wonders of, of Western civilization to the East and all mm. this bullshit, 
evaporates because, you know, it was a company. It was about making a profit as much as Goldman Sachs is about making a profit. Yeah. No one in the East India Company pretended they were bringing civilization anywhere. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were absolutely clear what they were after, which was making a fortune for themselves and their mm. shareholders. And, and indeed, it wasn't so much that they weren't interested in introducing Western civilization to India, but many of them even adopted Indian civilization while they were there. So this is a crucial point. You get two very different phases of colonization of India uh, by Britain over the 300 years. The East India Company is by far the most extractive. Uh, it's unapologetically uh, a business that involves shipping Indian gold back to Britain to build lovely country houses uh, and to buy rotten boroughs for its returning nabobs. Um, and it is looting, it, it plunders, uh, it builds very little in the way of public services or doesn't even pretend to sort of go around, you know, building railways or, uh, uh, or universities or health centres or anything else. But bizarrely, it's also very collaborative. Uh, it is financed by, uh, initially by Indian bankers, later by bonds issued by um, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the ordinary, sorry, financed initially by uh, Indian bankers, and then um, the whole of the Bengal population invest their savings in in East India Company bonds, mm. uh, which give fixed returns, and uh, and um, the company is very careful to honour these very very strictly. As a result of which, the entire earnings of Bengal go towards the company and allow it to expand its army and, and conquer further. And um, it's a nice little earner. Uh, it um, uh, by the time that they've conquered India, they suddenly realize that they don't need to ship out gold anymore from England. They just tax Indian people, uh, keep the profits after they've deducted the costs of the occupation, and with that now they buy the cotton, the silks, the opium, the indigo, and all the things they want to buy in India and sell at profit abroad. So, not only is it uh, you know a nice little earner anyway, uh, and, and a hugely profitable business to buy a piece of cotton in India and sell it for 10 times as much in England. Now you're getting the cotton for free because you're just taking tax revenues. Uh, so India is drained of its wealth. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the company is quite unapologetic about this. It's never promised to be there for the benefit of Indians. Uh, and the irony is that, you know, the Victorians pretend that they're there for anything other than plunder. Mm. Uh, and at the time, even no one particularly believes it, but uh, you occasionally find odd... Uh, British Empire apologists who still pretend that Britain was this sort of benign force and uh, uh, Britannia never did what uh, uh, the French did or the Belgians did in the Congo or the Germans in the Sudetenland. There's still this narrative that Britain's empire was some, somehow different, that it was a, a, an enormously benign force that brought democracy and railways and, and what have you to India. And it's just, you know, pie-in-the-sky ignorance mm. that uh, leads people to, do, to believe this today. In Britain today, there is no teaching of the empire in schools. We move from the Tudors to the Nazis with a brief stopover uh, where Britain liberates the Caribbean slaves. So as, as if the whole of British history had been this wonderful trajectory towards anti-racism and, and freedom. Uh, and the dark sides of our past, the Atlantic Passage, the slave trade, the conquest of India, the extraction of wealth, the massacres of any Indians who uh, who resist this process, as well as all the other stuff like the Tasmanian Aborigines and the, you know, the genocides which took place in various small genocides, just small massacres, hashtag. Um, uh, mm. This stuff is just not taught. Mm. And as a result, the British do not know it. And they think that they are, have a wonderful, innocent history of anti-racism, <laughs> freedom. And, uh, and you find historians who will trot the stuff out. Which has led us, I think, very largely to the impasse we have at the moment, where Britain is this sort of in this terrible muddle with Brexit, you know, wanting to escape uh, the control of Brussels, as, as the Brexiteers see it, while appealing somehow for to the old empire and old colonies to somehow come to the rescue. And quite literally, uh, Theresa May's first um, foreign trip after the Brexit vote uh, was to India uh, in a effort that uh, the civil service quite literally dubbed Empire 2.0. Mm. And they go to India, and the idea is, you know, we welcome you back in the fold. It was all a huge mistake. You know, we want to revive the Commonwealth. We'll, you know, we'll all club together, 
New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the old empire will all come together. It's all, it was a huge mistake in you know, the last 30 years. It'll all be absolutely wonderful. Come back, brothers. And, of course, no one's interested. Uh, you know, you guys have got your own narrative mm. down mm. here. The, uh, uh, the Indians are much more concerned about Pakistan than they are about Britain. Uh, Canada's, you know, in a, in, a, in a free trade arrangement with the United States. You know, the world has moved on in the last 60 years. Um, and the Brexiteers are living in Klaukukland largely because I think they're simply ignorant of history. As, as, as Burke famously said, those who, uh, those who are ignorant of history are destined always to repeat it. There's, there's so much I want to ask you about the, the history of the British East India Company, but I think in the interest of time, because we've got about 15 minutes left, I might pivot to some meta questions that I've been, been dying to ask you. So the sure. first is... Let's distinguish between two broad categories of doing history, uh, analytical history, maybe, you know, pioneered by the French Annales school. And then on the other hand, narrative history, which focuses more on, on characters uh, and, and maybe is more associated with, the, with Thomas Carlyle's view of history as being driven by great men. Your work seems to sit more firmly in the latter category. What do you think the benefits of narrative history are? Well, I should say that I sort of come out of an anal background, very specifically an anal background. My uncle was a, a famous economic historian at, at Cambridge called Munya Poston, yeah. uh, a Jewish refugee who fled the Bolsheviks. Um, his wife, Cynthia, was a person who translated Georges Duby, who was one of the founding fathers of the anal school and a, and a great friend of uh, Marc Bloch and uh, Leroy Ladurie. Um Okay. And so I grew up with all these guys, um, very much around. And my uh, uncle was a very formative figure. Um, and I think economic history is hugely important. Mm. Um, and I secrete a great deal of it in my work, mm. but in a, set, in a way that um, is readable. Uh, then I'll school at its worst sort of breaks down into um, sort of equations and sort of uh, Venn diagrams and uh, and sort of pseudoscientific um, puffery. Uh, and I think there are very few ideas outside high science which can't be actually conveyed very well by prose. Um, and uh, so while I certainly write, admire and like narrative history, I try and hide away into its uh, st a secret stowaway in, uh, in, in, in chapters, a lot of economic history and a lot of social history. And, and I think all that is there in, mm. in my work. Um, but the kind of history I like to read is well-written, well-researched, multilingual mm. nar narrative history. And my, my great guru is, is the Stephen Runciman mm. who So your your favorite history book is The Fall of Constantinople 1453 by Sir Stephen Runciman which to me is it, you know it does it encapsulates everything in a sense that I've tried to do Why is that your writing. favorite history book? Because it has everything that is wonderful about a great novel incredible characters uh, extraordinary story um, deeply moving storyline that leaves you gutted at the end. Uh, and yet it's true that you get the additional mm. satisfaction of knowing mm. this is not somebody's pipe dream coming out of a, an opium haze or uh, hours of sitting at his desk and imagining stuff. This is something that had happened. These, these people you're reading about lived. They are like us in many ways. Mm. And um, to me, that's just kind of win-win. If, if you can have the pleasure of fine language, clever plotting, brilliant characterization, descriptions of landscape that you would enjoy reading if it were in a novel, but which are actually actual descriptions of actual landscape. Um, and be able to trust the historian who's writing it mm. as having spent many years reading obscure sources and digging up new uh, primary evidence of, of events by people on all sides of the story. Runciman to write um, The Fall of Constantinople, which is the, the story of the end of Byzantium, this moment when this great empire, which is uh, you know, all that's left of the Roman Empire after the fall of Rome, which has kept the flame going for uh, a thousand years, 
this moment that the Turks under uh, uh, Suleiman uh, mass uh, on the Bosphorus and cross over to, and uh, eventually come down to the mm. Golden Horn and, and, and surround, besiege and finally take mm. uh, Constantinople and the last emperor rides <laughs> out into battle. I mean, it's all, you know, Superbly epic, dramatic. epic stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that to me is everything you know. I, I could ask from any book, really. It's 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 war and peace, except it's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all the characters yeah. are real. Beautiful. Um, and that is my model. I mean, to the extent that the last mogul is, comes close to plagiarism in terms of form and yeah. sort of uh, tone, and uh, it's it. My my story is the fall of Delhi and the end of the moguls. Yeah. But the that I mean there, it's a very very closely modelled on on what Runciman had done for, yeah. for 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 the different story. 300 years earlier, the fall of Constantinople. Um, and that's the kind of history I like reading and, and try and write, however unsuccessfully uh, I may be and however much less good I may be than Runciman. That's what I'm aiming at. Yeah. And um, I read a huge amount of other sorts of history. I mean, I still very much into that French medieval school, uh, Annal, and uh, Mark Bloch was my favourite historian at school, yeah. uh, college. Uh, and in fact, I got into Cambridge, I think, uh, waxing about how much I love Mark Block and feudal society, which I did. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, I try and take what I've learned from those guys and turn it into a narrative voice. Mm. And, you know, in an ideal world, you'll end up with, something, you know, McGibbon, people used to rush out and buy the latest volume of mm. The Decline and Fall with the same alacrity as they would buy a, a volume of Dickens mm. or, or, or the latest it was Jane Austen. Popularly or, enjoyed. It, they, yeah. were, they were popularly enjoyed. They were scholarly admired. Uh, yeah. and, and you had the best of all worlds. While, you know, the trouble we have today is that so many academic history books, whilst brilliantly researched, just aren't fun to read because they're not written to be read. They're written mm. to get tenure and to fend off other academic colleagues who are after the same <laughs> job. <laughs> and, you know, they're making micro points about uh, uh, some debate which no one else other than the other guys trying for the same job yeah, <laughs> is, yeah, is yeah. interested yeah. in. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're not there to be enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, they're, 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 they're ticking an academic box. Yeah. Um, and I see no reason why, in principle, great history, scholarly history, academic history cannot also be written in, in a literary style, yeah. a narrative style. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, you can get the analysis in. You can get the, uh, the detailed uh, socio-economic and financial material. I mean, you know, a lot of the story of the East India Company and the mm. anarchy is, is, is a financial story. Mm. Um, I think um, several reviewers have noted there could be a little bit more finance in this book, and I think, and I think, uh, you know, if I was writing again, yeah, possibly. I mean, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a doorstopper already. What do they want? To, you, if you make it any bigger, you'll be, you can put this between the U.S. and Mexico, and that'll, that'll be the war. <laughs> Refugees crawling yeah, over other little copies of the anarchy. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would add uh, an intellectual reason for preferring narrative history beyond just the, the pleasure and enjoyment of reading the prose, and that is, it seems to me that narrative history is best placed to capture the non-linearities and path dependency of history as it happened in the real world, um, as opposed to, you know, so counter example might be Polybius, the Greek historian who wrote about Rome in the second century BC, and he had this view of the patterns of, of growth and decay in history, and he, this grand causal theory about how Rome escaped this pattern through the, the checks and balances inherent in its constitution. Um, you know, that, to me, that is really a narrative um, and contrast that with focusing on characters and relationships, um, which, which I think you're more attracted to. I think that is in a sense altogether more, more accurate. There's, there's just an, an example from your book I'd like to, to raise, and that is the founding of Madras uh, and Francis Day, which was done so he could be closer to a woman. Uh, in he, land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, it, Madras wasn't founded for some grand narrative. It was just a guy who wanted to have more sex, yeah. which probably explains most of history. <laughs> history exactly one way or another. And I think, uh, you know, the if we're thinking about our own age... Mm. You know, we're aware that when an election comes up, that a declining economy can lose a party, an mm. election, and a rising economy can mm. gain an election, even if they're Trump. Mm. But we're also aware that a single individual can make a, a major difference. In my own 
country at the moment, the fact that Boris Johnson, who really couldn't decide mm. about the benefits of either uh, leaving the European Union or staying on it, and who famously wrote two pieces for the Telegraph, one making the argument one way, one making the other, before deciding clearly that for his own career and his wish to become prime minister, yeah. that, that, that the better choice was to support Brexit. Mm. Now, he is, 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 you know, for all his faults, is an amazing campaigner, an amazing speaker, and a hugely popular figure. And I don't think anyone today would deny that the fact that Boris Johnson joined mm. the Brexit campaign changed the course of British history, mm. I, I think, catastrophically mm. for the future. Uh, but there is an example from our own time that we can judge with all our senses of, of an individual. And not necessarily, you know, we're not talking this sort of slightly loopy Victorian great man thing where, you know, Boris is the is the great uber hero who who transformed history through his genius. So just the fact that he's, you know, quite a good speaker, quite yeah. popular, swung it and yeah. got that vote over the line. Yeah. The extra one or two percentage points that, that made the difference between loss and victory. Mm. Um, and that, you know, any any commonsensical in, uh, interpretation of Brexit has to take that decision. He took one man into uh, into consideration. Mm. So when you're looking backwards at history, it's the same. You know, uh, a, a, a single person can change the course of history by doing one thing or screwing up or you know not getting out of bed in time or going off and seeing his girlfriend in land in Madras. You know, all those <laughs> things, all those things can play a role in history yeah. as much as a growing economy, new yeah. methods of warfare, fantastic inventions in ship design or whatever it is. All mm. these things do play their part. Mm. But individuals, innovations cock-ups of various sorts <laughs> uh, do change the course of history too and, yeah. and and we know that from our own time yeah i have two final quick questions number one is uh so this is a very selfish question i'm in the process of writing a book on the australian housing bubble and housing bubbles generally at the moment i've been ri- reaching out to a lot of authors whose writing i admire uh you're obviously one of them in other words stephen pinker don't always agree with his conclusions, but I love the way he writes. He's a good writer, him, yeah. Yeah, what his, what his process was. He said that uh, his method is to write sequentially from the first to the last sentence and as intensively as possible, almost all day, seven days a week, till he's done. I'm on his cap, yeah. You think that's the better I, way to I do it? the same. I, um, I'm always amazed when you hear these stories of novelists who say that they you know, set off on their novel and they have no idea what... And, uh, they, they start with an idea or a smell or a snatch of music or something mm. and suddenly mm. the, the novel creates itself out of nowhere with me with my history books every single twist every single plot turn is plotted Mm. i know before i start writing exactly what's going to happen in every sentence which doesn't mean there are not things that change and 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 i see connections i didn't see when i'm actually writing which i didn't see when i was plotting and thing and there is still room for innovation and inspiration and all these things which do come when you suddenly have your fingers tapping away at the at the keyboards but I have a very, very, very clear plan. And I compare it to Chinese cooking. You know, you um, spend, in my case, often four or five years chopping up the ingredients. So all your spring onions are nicely diced and your ginger is prepared in a, in a, uh, in a little pile in the corner of the chopping board. And uh, uh, the lamb is nicely marinated with all the fat bits cut off and waiting within the soy sauce ready to go. And then you put it in the wok yeah. at high heat and you cook it as quickly as you can for four or five minutes and then you serve. Okay. That's the same model for me. Yeah. I'm naturally very sociable. I like to eat and, and see people. But for the nine months, it usually takes me to write one of these doorstoppers. Yeah. I, go to, I go to ground. I go on a diet. I stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I never have lunch with anyone. And I will only go out at night twice or t- a week. Yeah. I, instead, I'll usually be uh, falling asleep and snoring into Netflix <laughs> by about eight o'clock. And then up by five, I've already got my work from the previous day printed out by my bed. I'm correcting it through till about seven, typing it in till about nine, and hopefully, if all goes well, writing new stuff by about half past ten or eleven in the morning. Continue without a break through till about four or five, mm. when I finally sort of just crash. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, the, some of my best ideas float into my head when I'm doing something unrelated, taking a shower, going for a walk. Those what, two things, very specifically, oddly enough, always it's walks, yeah, and showers, showers, and and jogs, yeah, and swims. My my other one is uh, one of the, oddly one of the things I love the most about travel is being in airports. It's like you have or this, airplanes where yeah. you can't look at your phone. Yeah, and you yeah. and but you have this you have an alibi from the rest of the world. And you're in a bubble, and and that's where I, I have some I great ideas. I don't think I've um, 
ever had an airport inspiration. But I, I certainly had an. Air, <laughs> I certainly had an. Uh, 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 a mid-flight right. moment because I again, you know, your whole world is suddenly suspended. Yeah. Yeah. Um, until recently, there was no question of looking at the internet. Mm. Uh, I always feel vaguely guilty looking at movies on flights. I think you, know, <laughs> you should be should be planning yeah, stuff yeah, and thinking yeah. through stuff. And and yes, so th- that is a very good moment for correcting, mm. for planning, for writing and ideas. I often uh, end up uh, with uh, with ideas on my notepad yep. uh, at the end of Same the flight. Way, yeah. The big ideas, the, big, yeah. you know, the wider picture. Yeah. Final question. What What's the modern lesson we should take from the anarchy? Well, the anarchy is a story of something that happened in the 18th century. Mm-hmm. Um, and history never exactly repeats itself. So I'm always wary about using uh, a history book as a sort of direct lesson for the future because it isn't, it's the story of the past but the big story of the anarchy I suppose is the meta story of the power of the state against the power of the corporation now Mm. in this particular story after 200 years the state wins Mm. Uh, there's moments when it looks like the company is going to be able to swerve the legislature of the state. It bribes MPs, 40% of MPs of shareholders by about 1770. It's caught for the first time in the first case of corporate corruption. There's insider trading. There's all these things that goes on uh, and, and methods it learns to bend the state to its will so that you get this mysterious alchemy that we know so well in our own time whereby the interests of shareholders of a particular company become mysteriously the interests of the state for example exxon in uh, in iraq uh, under the bush government suddenly we have an invasion of a country which seems to be suiting uh, oil companies more than the people of the united states so the but i think the the, the simple lesson is you know the battle of the state against the corporation, Mm. against the big company, against big tech, big pharma, big data. Um, These are lessons which, and these are battles which each generation has to wave because the company, the corporation, will resist regulation. It will resist being um, uh, boxed in. Uh, And yet it is the crucial issue. Uh, You know, we have two mobile phones in this recording studio we're going we're all going to get tomorrow on our social media feed um adverts for east india company t because we've been talking about it you know <laughs> uh, with data harvesting and surveillance capitalism now companies are listening to us every minute they're in our fridges they're in our heads they're in our pockets they know what we're going to do they know where we're going to be they google knows where we've been every minute for the last 20 years mm. uh, and um these are Every bit as powerful adversaries as the East India Company was with its weaponry, its artillery, its Mm. cavalry, Mm. its infantry. Uh, And we have to be careful. These corporations are very, very powerful. And each generation will have to fight this battle uh, each time anew. Mm. William Dalrymple. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing this sauna of a studio with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're eating up as much as I am. <laughs> you're a thank treasure, you. but thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with William Dalrymple as much as I clearly did. For everything we discussed during our chat, you can find links and show notes on my website. That is www josephnoelwalker.com that's my full name j-o-s-e-p-h-n-o-e-l-w-a-l-k-e-r.com and you can follow me on twitter to continue the conversation my handle is at joseph n walker until next time thank you for listening ciao